So tonight we will be going through uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll give you guys a second to turn there. And, and we will be covering the majority of the chapter tonight. So I'll read through it real quick and then, then we'll get started. The, the title is, is The Days of the Lord. But, but our focus tonight is, is for what the Lord wants us to be doing in, during this time. So verse 1 starts, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness, therefore... Let us watch and be sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that, whatever, that what, whether we are awake or asleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, Comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And we esteem them very, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are truly, who are unruly, comfort the faint hearted. Uphold the weak and be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good. But for yourselves, both for yourselves and for all, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may, the whole sp may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So, a few months ago, uh, I think it was back in August, Pastor Ed had asked me to teach, and I taught on a Wednesday night. And I covered, we, we looked at Matthew chapter 24, uh, Ezekiel chapter 38. We looked at a, a lot of prophecy that the Lord gave us during that time. Some of the things that we went over were actually things that won't even take place till the time of the tribulation, but we already see those things uh, coming to fruition and, and coming in place. So, so we could even look at those things that aren't even till after the rapture and, and see that those are even coming into place. So we, we've seen things now when, where we're at in, in today's time, especially with Israel, many things that the Lord wrote about in his word, prophecies that we will, we will see coming to fruition within the, the time ahead of us here. Uh, we've seen things like Israel be established as a nation back in 1948, after being scattered throughout the world. Uh, we've, we've seen Israel become prosperous and be the focus of all the world's attention, just like the Lord said it would. It, even lately in the last month here, peace treaties that our government helped work out with Israel and the UAE and, and others that are currently coming together as fruit from that. Uh, Israel's actually looking to sign another peace treaty with Saudi Arabia now. And, and we see that all of these things that were either written about directly in his word or things that were alluded to, like nations that would align in the end times just like they are, just like we're seeing them align today. 
Sorry, my iPad's going a little crazy here. Um, but tonight, as we dig into chapter 5 of, of Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica, um, this chapter doesn't really give us much for, for prophecies or expect what to look for. It doesn't really lay out much things like that. But it, it lets us know what we should be doing. Now that we see the times coming, where, where the end times are coming, we actually get to see what we should be doing. There's lots of, of verses in the Bible that tell us how we should live and different things. But this, this chapter specifically lays out what should we be doing in, in these times. In verse 1 it says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And even at that, Paul's telling us that, that there's no need to write. We know we're, we're in those days now from all the things that we've already read from his word that we've already seen. You could even ask non-believers and they know that we're at some times of some huge change right now. And in Matthew 24, where, where um, Pastor Ed went over the book of Matthew recently, or chapter 24, Jesus tells us that no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows the specific time that the Lord's coming for us. And this is where Paul gets that comparison to the thief in the night. In Matthew 24, verse 43, Jesus said, But know this, that if the master of the house had not known what hour the thief would come, he would, ha uh, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So yes, we, we see this day coming upon us from all the information the Lord's given us, but we see here that there's no need to worry about when it'll be. We know it's coming. We don't need to worry about the, the day, the hour, or even the year. There's no need to focus on things like that. In Matthew 6.34, the Lord told us not even to worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things that sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So I, I don't want to focus on, on that stuff tonight, but, but more the things that come later on what we should be doing in this time, like I said. So verse 3 says, When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We're not of darkness because we have his, his word. We, we know this stuff is coming. We don't have to, to guess at it. And for those of us that have accepted the Lord's free gift of salvation, he refers to us here as sons of light and sons of the day. I, I love that, that, that he would refer to us that way. I mean, we're also referred to as his children. And uh, it's just such a, a blessing to be referred to that way. In verse 6, he says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, at, those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. So, of course, we all sleep, and Paul's not referring here to that, but he's referring to it spiritually, that we need to be alert, that we should be aware of the, of the things that are going, around us, going on around us, that we shouldn't be blind to the things of the Spirit. And he references those who get drunk, and that we should watch and be sober. I found it interesting that, that he puts those together, that we should watch and be sober, because... Um, when, when we drink, when, when people drink alcohol or even lots of other drugs, it slows the reaction time of their pupils. So I don't know if, it, if you've ever noticed, maybe on TV or, or if, if any of you might have ever experienced it, like I have, uh, when a pol police officer gives you a, a test, um, of course back in my BC days, but when a police officer gives a test for a DUI, they shine a light, they shine a, their flashlight in your eyes to see how your pupils are going to react. Because when we drink, our, our pupils react much slower to the light. So that's one of the things they look for, and it impairs our peripheral vision. 
So, so some would call it tunnel vision. We can't see as much what's going on around us when we're, we're, we're drinking. So it was interesting to me that, that Paul compared it that way, inspired by the Lord, of course. And, and we can't be vigilant, if I'm saying that correctly, spiritually, uh, when we're drunk with alcohol or drugs, or even just the numbing ourselves out with the cares of this world. We, we need to be able to see what's going on, on around us and be prepared. Verse 8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate, breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. The breastplate of faith and love. We get, with that, the breastplate sits in front of us, right? It would sit in this area. And I think what he's telling us here is that we could face everything in front of us with the faith and the love that the Lord's given us. So when we put on our armor, we have that breastplate of our faith in, and, and his love in front of us. And as a helmet, the hope which he refers to later when he talks about the armor, the, ar- the helmet of salvation. Here he says, helmet of the hope of salvation the hope that we have in him, the hope in our eternity with him. That's what protects our minds, protects our minds from the attacks of the enemy. It's our hope in in our future with him that can protect us from the things that we see going on, depression coming on from from the things that we see going on around us, the attacks of the enemy. It's that hope that'll keep us from dwelling on the fears that we're, from everything going on. We have some crazy things going on right now. Today was the inauguration. We've seen riots. We've seen all kinds of things. And the fears that, that dwell up, that well up in us, it's the hope that brings us. I mean, we even saw uh, Morgan and, and Tori in our Give 10 tonight talking about our youth facing these same hurdles. Uh, fear and anxiety and depression was one of the prayer points we, we were praying for and we need to continue to pray for them and, and pray that not only us as, as parents will help them not to focus on those things, even though it's hard for us not to focus on them, but to turn their eyes back to the Lord and the hope that they can only find in Him. Verse 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. It's such an important verse. This verse points us to other things, also like the rapture. Um, As we see these days of tribulation coming ahead of us, we know that the tribulation is when the Lord pours out his wrath upon the world, upon the nations. In Revelation 16, 1, We're told, then I heard a loud voice saying from the temple, saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. But he's, the Lord's telling us right here that we're not appointed to wrath. So that, that's another hope that we can have. That, that I know there's many views of, of the, the rapture when it comes to tribulation and, um, but what I believe is that it's pre-tribulation rapture. It's before, and especially from verses like this. There's multiple, but verses like this that say that we're not appointed to wrath. We know that the tribulation is the wrath of God, and we aren't appointed to it. Um, we, so this is why we know he's going to save us from, from his wrath during the tribulation. Verse 11 says, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. So that's what we should be doing right now, edifying one another. Edifying is one of those words that, that we really only see here in the Bible and, and Christians speak, but it's building one another up to edify one another. And he says here to edify one another and comfort one another. In this room right now, wow, the stories that we could tell of the things that we've been through with all of us. Besides 2020, just in our life, 
the, the, all the different things that we've been through, but also the things that the Lord comforted us through. And the Lord helped us through those things. And in 2 Corinthians, if you want to turn there with me real quick, in chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. That, that's huge. There's a lot of brothers and sisters right now, our brothers and sisters in the world, in our nation, in this church, hurting. And we need to be building each other up and comforting each other. Like, like we were saying in that video that we did for with the COVID stuff. Let's be the church outside of these doors. Let's reach out to one another and bring comfort to one another. We all have spiritual gifts. If you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, I encourage you to, to search that on our website on, on calvaryco.church. Search that for, for spiritual gifts. Pastor Ed did an awesome study on spiritual gifts and, and explaining what they are and how they're used and things like that. And, and it's a huge blessing to know what your spiritual gifts are. But all of the spiritual gifts, besides the gift of tongues, are not for ourselves. They're for us in this room. They're for the edifying of the church, the building up of each other. And he's also given us our testimony, our life experiences, his goodness in our lives, his faithfulness and his comfort that we should be sharing with one another, with one another. It's, it's that comfort that he's given us that we should be sharing with others. In this church in particular, at Calvary Church, Calvary Aurora, um, a lot of broken people tend to come here because a lot of us have been through some really hard things. We know what our pastor has been through in his family, losing Eddie. So the Lord tends to use our pastor and use this church greatly to comfort people. So don't let that get past you. Don't forget that you have that, those testimonies too. We all have all these different testimonies me, myself, I have a lot of them. One of them in particular that the Lord uses me to relate to people here a lot is that when I was 18, I was in a car accident. I, I rolled a car. I was drinking and driving. I was ejected. I broke my neck in a couple places, my back in multiple places, my shoulders, my upper jaw, and, and just seeing that, seeing that pain. And it was because of my sin. But still, even that, the Lord uses today for me to be able to relate to people that are going through that, going through pains, going through the hard things. So don't let that, don't let your trials be in vain. Use those. Be there for one another. Comfort one another. It's not always easy to do, to talk about that stuff. Me as a pastor now, to talk about why I was in that accident, the things that involved it there. It's not easy. But those are the things that, that, that help us build each other up to relate to each other, to comfort each other, to be brothers and sisters in the Lord. Something that he uses greatly here. In verse 12, uh, it says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace amongst yourselves. We definitely have a wonderful team of brothers and sisters here. I'm blessed to work with, with this team every day. Um, brothers and sisters, leaders in our body, leaders within that aren't even on staff, but the leaders that, that are, are part of this church. So please remember when those hard times come up, if a, any spiritual leader in your life has to admonish you, 
reprimand you or rebuke you, it's never easy. It's always done in, with prayer and in love. That, that's one of the things that, that Pastor David Guzik said when he was referring to leaders was, leaders are recognized not by their title, but by their service. And that's something that you can use to gauge when you have those hard things, when you have a brother or sister in the Lord rebuke you or reprimand you. Remember that, that they're doing it in love. It's a, it's a good measuring stick to know your leaders, the leaders that, that are above you spiritually or, or with working, serving with you spiritually, to know that that's, to be a good leader, it's the service that defines them not their title. Verse 14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. These are all ways that we can support each other as believers. We're to, to warn the unruly. And, and that word, unruly, and, and of course, do it gently, gently and in love, but that word unruly is defined in, in other places in the Bible, used as boisterous or disruptive. Uh, it's also been used in, in the word as to describe someone that's disobedient or even idle. We're, we're to warn each other when we see each other backsliding and falling into that. We're to comfort the faint-hearted. We're, we're told here again that, that to bring comfort to one another like, like we were referencing earlier. And, and never forget that you have the Holy Spirit. Those of us that are saved have the Holy Spirit. And if you allow him to lead and guide you, it, he'll do that. He'll bring comfort. The same Holy Spirit that indwelled Paul when he was inspired to write these verses. The same Holy Spirit that Jesus referred to in John fourteen twenty six as the comforter. In, in the King James Version, it calls him the great comforter, comforter. You have that same Holy Spirit within you. We're to uphold the weak in that next piece of the verse. We, we're to uphold the weak. The New Living Translation, I like the way it puts it. It says that, that we're to take tender care of the weak. And, we're to, and then it says we're to be patient with all men. Plenty of these things that, that Paul's teaching us here are in reference to each other, working with each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And occasionally he'll throw one in there like this, to be patient with all men. And so that we'll touch on that again in a little bit, that, that all men right now in these times of division and divisiveness is so important. Verse 15 says, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. So amongst us, we should never seek vengeance or revenge. We know that the Lord tells us that vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. That is usually the way we remember it from the King James. But we're to pursue what is good for ourselves and for others. It doesn't say pursue what is good for our family or pursue what is good for our friends. But it says, pursue what is good for all. This past weekend when Pastor Ed was teaching, he quoted something from, from uh, another really good pastor, Pastor Miles McPherson. And, and he said, when we refer to anyone else as anything less than neighbor, we give ourselves permission to treat, to treat them as such. We're directed by our creator to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus specifically told us, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and our neighbor, I was kind of chuckling when I was researching a little bit to say, well, what does the, the Bible define as neighbor? And I found out that a lot of people have searched, what does the Bible define as neighbor? And I think mostly people search that to find out, okay, who, who can I get away with not treating as my neighbor? But it was a, one of the top searches on Google when I put in our neighbor. But the Bible defines our neighbor as our fellow man, 
not the person that lives next to us, not, not within the same city, but our fellow man. That's the way the Bible uses that word multiple times throughout the scripture. So no matter their race, their ethnicity, their, their political standing, whether they sin different than me or sin different than you, they battle with different sins, that doesn't matter. That doesn't keep them from being a fellow man or fellow man. There, there's nothing that precludes someone else from being your fellow man or from being your neighbor. And we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. The enemy's been doing some serious work lately here in our nation, some serious work of division. We're seeing it all over. We're seeing it politically. We're seeing it racially more than ever. It's, it's really sad to see. It's heartbreaking to see that the strongholds that the enemy is getting, the footholds that the enemy is getting for division in our nation. Not just in our nation, but even in the church. All across the nation, we're seeing churches in division like, like I've never seen before. For us, during a time like this, this is when we should be focusing on, on treating everyone as our neighbor. Sharing the love of the Lord with everyone else wherever we go. Jesus said that they will know you by your love for one another. That's how we're supposed to be known as Christians. Not seeking divisions or, or tribalism or any of that stuff, but our love for one another, that's how we're supposed to be known as Christians. Verse 16 says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In John 15, Jesus tells us to abide in him. If we abide in him, we acknowledge him in all that we do. That's a good way we can pray without ceasing. So, of course, we, we should have a dedicated time of prayer. We should have time that we focus on our communication with the Lord. We, we really do need to have that dedicated time. But that word to abide, to dwell in him, as Jesus put it to us, if we do that, we can constantly see things through that lens. We, we need to remember, one of the things that helps me remember is Psalm 139. But that's because it, we need to remember that God's always present. Yes, we have his Holy Spirit, but he's omnipresent, so he's everywhere at all times. And it helps me to know that there's nothing too small for me to take to him. There's nothing too small in your life that you can't take to him. In Psalm 139, David wrote in verse 17, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. He tells us that he knows the number of hairs on our head. David says that, that his thoughts, God's thoughts for him are more than the numbers of the sand. More in number than the sand. He doesn't say the sand on a beach, the sand in a, a specific desert. More than the sand is the way it's written. That's how many thoughts the Lord has of you. So there's nothing in your life. There's no moment of your day that's insignificant to the Lord. Every moment of our lives are significant to him and mean something to him. In verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. At times, it can be hard or even somewhat confusing to give thanks for everything, especially some of the hard things that we're going through. But we can rely on his promise. One of the really well-known verses, of course, is Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God. All things. So we can give thanks. Sometimes it's not till after. It's not till after the growth that we've seen, the things that we've seen the Lord do in those situations. As far as I referenced earlier, the wreck that I was in, 
I definitely couldn't give thanks as I was going through it. I was actually in bed for like five months after that. My mom had to take care of me for about five months. I definitely wasn't ready to give thanks at that moment. But now, to see what the Lord has done in my life because of it, I wouldn't be standing here today. If any of you are, know the Calvary Chapel movement, Calvary pastors tend to have that kind of testimony. We don't have many here in Calvary Church at this particular um, church with that kind of testimony, but, but that was my testimony. I was involved in all kinds of messes. And I wouldn't be here. I literally wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be alive or I'd be in prison. Most of the friends I grew up with have passed. I have a couple friends left that I grew up with that are, that are actually living good lives. But most of them have passed. And I really, truly believe that's where I would be if the Lord didn't use that to, to wake me up. So we can even give thanks for things like that. In verse 19, it says, do not quench the spirit. There are many ways that we can quench the spirit. It's kind of a, a weird wording, right? To quench the spirit. Quenching something is usually referred to as putting a flame out. Quenching a flame or quenching a fire. And, and there's many ways that we can do that. But, but mainly, we can focus on we can't allow ourselves to block the spirit from working in our lives or in the lives of those around us. In, in my life, in our lives, but in my life in particular, I know that one of the biggest ways I've tended to quench the spirit is because of fear. Fear has many times caused me to quench the spirit. And usually it's because I, I'm not allowing the Lord to do a work in my life or use me because I think I can't do it. That's always where I go. And many of us go, I can't do it. I won't be able to do that. I can't do that. And we need to remember that, no, I can't do that. And I can't make it to heaven. It's only through God. Earlier, I mentioned John uh, chapter 15, when Jesus tells us to abide in him. But, but in that, when he tells us to abide in him, Jesus says that I am... Th that I am the vine and you are the branches. And, and as branches, there's, we can't do much. We can't produce fruit without the, the vine, right? I'm sure many pastors have taught on that, how as a branch, there's not much we can do. We need the vine. We need to dwell in Jesus. But it's him who produces the fruit. And, and we can trust in that, that it's him who will get it done. In verse 20, it says, Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. The Lord gave us many prophecies in his word that have been completed already, stuff that we can look back to to see what, what he's done. So we know that the things that are coming up will come to fruition. Because we see that all the many things, even just the few that I referenced at the beginning, Israel becoming a nation again. No other nation has ever done that. No nation that has been decimated or scattered has ever come back to their land. But the Lord told us it would happen, and it did. To a, to a desert, which is now again referred to as a land of milk and honey. A prosperous nation. So we know the things that he's told us about will come to fruition. And for the second piece of that, that verse there, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Whether it's a prophecy or, or a teaching, we know we can test it by his word. That's what he's referring to here, that we test all things by his word. And we only need to hold fast to what is good. 22 tells us, abstain from every evil. And as he goes on there in the closing, I'll, I'll read through it real quick. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. 
Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And of course, we don't do a, no holy kisses, especially now in the midst of everything we're going through, right? But we're given plenty of guidance from the Lord on how to live our lives, how to love, how to live in peace. But I really appreciate in this chapter, chapter 5, at the end of that letter to the uh, church of Thessalonica, that he gave us specifically what we should be doing during this time, the times that we're living in today. Back in verse 5, he refers to those of us that have accepted his gift of salvation. He refers to us as sons of light and sons of the day. What a special privilege, like I said earlier, to be referred to that way as sons of light. We have his light. And he tells us not to put it under a basket or put it under a bed. We're told to let his light shine, to let his love shine. He fills us with so much love we can pour it out onto others. And as, and as we, we finish up here, I, I want to invite Pastor Ian and the worship team back. But if there's anyone here tonight that hasn't made that decision to choose life, to choose to give their life to Jesus. We, we were created for one purpose. He created this whole world for one purpose. And that's that we, so we can have the choice to spend eternity with him or not. He created us for an eternal relationship with him. And here, we're here for that decision. So if there's anyone here, what you have to do to, to become saved, as we put it, you can have that today by acknowledging that you're a sinner, by accepting that Jesus came into the world, lived a sinless life, and died for us on the cross and rose again to pay for our sins, mine and yours. By turning from your sin and repenting and accepting Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. So if there's anyone here that wants to make that dedication today to give their life to the Lord, I'll ask you to stand up. Make that, make that public declaration to say, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready to follow the Lord. I'm ready to, to seek Him and His will for my life. I choose to spend eternity with you, God, and not separated from you. And even in this room, if we don't have anybody, we know we have people listening on Grace FM online. So I want to give them the opportunity to. Them the opportunity to pray and seek the Lord. And, and if that's where you're at, driving around in your car right now, watching online, just pray. Just pray, Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to please forgive me of my sins. I want what you have for my life and not my own will, but yours to be done in my life. I want to spend eternity with you. So I repent, I turn from my sins, and I choose to follow you. Thank you guys for allowing me to be here with you today to share his word. It's such a blessing to be part of this church. Such a blessing. We're such, such a great family here. But thank you guys. And let's, let's worship the Lord with Pastor Ian and the team. Amen.